All right, hi everybody. So this question here says a function uh, and its first and second derivatives are shown below. So here we go. So our function here is the natural log of x squared over x. Okay, and then uh, yeah, we've got the the first derivative and the second derivative. And really, what we're going to do here is we're just going to go through the steps here required to to graph this thing. Now. We start off with taking limits here and whatnot, but actually one of the things that we should really do before we get into this is take a quick look at the original function here. We'll just put it over here. So we've got f of x is equal to the natural log of x squared over x. And actually it's gonna be helpful to us uh, right away here to determine what the domain is, okay? I know there's actually better notation for, for the domain, but I'm, I'm kinda lazy, so I'm just gonna write the, the d colon. When you take a look at a natural log, Okay, well, actually, I should say, first of all, first of all, we know that x can't be zero. x cannot be zero. That's because of the, the division by zero right here. So that's, that's an easy one. Now let's take a look at the natural log here. The natural log uh, of x squared. Now think about what the, the natural log does here. Uh, you can, at this point here, we're only defining this so that you can take the, the log of a positive value here. But this makes all values positive, whether it's whether x is positive or negative, the square is going to be positive. In fact, the only restriction here would be that x cannot equal zero. And so there we go. Boom. Again, x cannot equal zero. Now, don't, don't get confused by this, okay? I am allowed to do that, okay? I am allowed to bring that down, okay, algebraically. That, that is a step that I can do here. But that does actually change the domain of the result. In this case right here, the domain is that x has to be, not only, sorry, not only can x not be equal to zero, but it has to be greater than zero. So if this was the original function that we were given, that would be acceptable to say that x here, x must be greater than zero, not, not or equal to, just greater than zero, because of the natural log here specifically. But that wasn't the original question, this was the original question, and in here, I am allowed to throw in negatives there because I move that, uh, sorry, the square, I didn't move it up, it was there to begin with, makes everything inside that argument become positive, and so it doesn't matter if x is, is positive or negative there, and away we go. So I just wanted to point out, because that is going to become an issue in this question. Now, the very first thing I'm being asked to do is to take the limit as x approaches, uh, let's say, zero from the right of our function f of x. Okay, now let's just think about that. So here's our function. If I approach zero from the right, now because of the square here, it really doesn't matter whether I'm approaching it from the, the right or the left, okay? Um, this value here is going to be the, the same, but when you take the log of a very, very small number, okay, one that's approaching zero, the logarithm is negative. I just need you to think about what, the, what a log looks like. Okay, here's one. When you are between zero and one, the log is negative. The denominator here is going to be positive, so that means that I'm going to go to negative infinity when you take the limit as x approaches zero from the, the right. If we take the limit as x approaches zero from the left of our function, well, you get a similar sort of thing going on here. The, the numerator is going to drop to negative infinity again because, because of that square there. It's gonna behave the same on both sides. But my denominator in this case is going to introduce a negative, and so, all together, these two negatives will cancel, and this is going to go off to positive infinity. Now let's take a look here. If we take the limit as x approaches infinity, let's say positive infinity of f of x, let's think about how it behaves. Now I've got a logarithmic function over just a, a regular old polynomial x, okay, a linear function here. But logarithmic functions grow incredibly slowly. Okay, they grow incredibly slowly. So what's gonna happen here is this linear function, as simple as it is, is going to dominate in terms of the growth here. This is going to get very big while this remains uh, relatively small. And so as a result, this is actually gonna go off to zero. Now I'm answering that more based off of my, my comfort level with, with these functions here. Um, if, if you're not kind of convinced of that, one of the things you can do is, is Let's just play with that in your calculator, plug in some values, and just investigate what's going on there on your own. If we take the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x, okay, so what happens when we go the other way with this, with this guy right here? 
Well, actually, the behavior in the, the numerator is going to be exactly the same. Because of that square, uh, the natural log here is going to treat going left and right basically identically. So really, we've got to look at the denominator. And again, the denominator is going to become a very, very large negative number. So we are going to approach, we are going to approach zero once again. Okay, albeit from a, a slightly different direction here. Here we're going to approach zero, if you will, from the, the positive side, and here we're going to approach it from the negative side. Okay, so basically from above zero, here we're going to approach it from below zero. At least that's what that's saying. Okay, let's take a look now. The, the second part of this was to find the critical numbers, points of inflection and cusp. So we're going to investigate what's going on with the, with the derivatives here. So with my first derivative, okay, I'm to find the critical numbers, I'm interested in where my first derivative, and I've got it written up here, I'm interested where this is zero or undefined. Now it's going to be undefined at zero. We've already established that, but that's not in the domain of the function, so that's actually not even an issue. So now what I gotta do is I gotta figure out where this is equal to zero, and if I set this equal to zero, I would bring up the x squared. So this will be two natural log of x squared, and I would multiply through by that x squared by this zero. Basically, essentially what's going on here is, is if I've got a rational function equaling zero, it's not because the denominator's doing anything. So I'm going to really just ignore the denominator. I'll bring my natural log of x squared over to the, the left-hand side is equal to 2. This is a well, this is a logarithmic equation, so I'm going to solve this by converting forms. So this will become e squared is equal to x squared. Uh, and now I will take the square root of both sides, and I will get essentially x is equal to positive or negative e. OK? That's fine. So there's my two critical numbers. Now this question was also asking for where my, I get my inflection points or cusps. Now there's a little bit more to, to this because in order to figure out if they're inflection points or cusps, you need to investigate the intervals. And we're going to do that in just a minute here, but we'll at least find the potentials. So the second derivative will, uh, is 2 natural log of x squared minus 6 over x cubed, and again, this was given to us. Okay, So I'm going to set that equal to zero. Well, I could ask where is it undefined, but, but once again, it's undefined at zero, and that's not in the domain of the function, so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to multiply through by my x squared, so 2 natural log of x squared, I'll bring the 6 over, I'll divide by 2, okay, and so now I've got this, this natural log of of x squared is equal to 3. Just like I did before, I'm going to solve this logarithmic function by converting forms, make that e cubed is equal to x squared, and then I'll take the square root of both sides, and I will get positive or negative uh, the square root of e cubed is equal to x. Now, I don't know if those correspond to inflection points or cusps, okay? but I know that in a sense they are the critical numbers of the first derivative. okay? So just like these right here are the critical numbers of the original function, okay, here are the critical numbers of that, that first derivative when you set it equal to zero. But we'll just investigate now the intervals of increasing and decreasing and the intervals of concavity just to see what's going on here. So let's take a quick look at this, and this will be part C. So I'm going to look at my number line here. Uh, I still have to include zero when I'm looking for intervals of increasing and decreasing because it's an asymptote and the behavior of a function can differ quite significantly on either side of an asymptote, so I've got to include that. And then I've got negative e over here, and I've got positive e over here, and that breaks the number line up into these, these four regions here, these four domains. Now let's just take a look here. Now if you pick a number, let's go up to our, our first derivative. If you pick a number less than negative e, okay, less than negative e, well my denominator is going to become uh, positive, that's, that's easy. And if you pick a number less than negative e, like let's say, let's say for example, uh, a million, negative one million. Well, negative one million, even as, as slow as logarithms grow, a negative million squared is this huge number. The natural log of that is, even though it's going to be a positive number, it's going to be uh, like bigger than two. So two minus that, that, that's going to be negative. So it's going to be negative over here. In the interval though between negative e and zero, Okay, if we pick a number like negative 1 in here, once again, the denominator, oh, sorry, 
can't. Uh, sorry, yeah, I can do that. That's I'm fine. I, I was second guessing myself. There's another problem that I was thinking of just, just for a brief second there. If I plug negative one into this, the denominator is, is positive. Uh, if, and conveniently enough, if you plug negative one into your logarithm here, that goes to zero. So you're just left with positive two. So it's going to be positive. The derivative will be positive there in that interval. If you pick uh, positive one and plug that in there, okay, positive one, um, positive one squared, okay, uh, is going to be positive down here. This is going to be zero. So once again, uh, you're going to get, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, was I was glancing up at the question. I've got another sheet of paper up here. I was looking at the wrong question just for a moment and I thought, what is going on here? Yeah, yeah, there we go. And if you pick another another uh, value greater than e out here, same as before, because the behavior is, is symmetric here, you're going to be uh, decreasing. So my intervals of increase are going to be from uh, negative e out to, to zero, can't include zero, union zero out to positive e, and we will include those. My intervals of decrease will be from negative infinity out to negative e, union positive e out to positive infinity. Now let's take a look over here at our concavity, and we'll do a, a similar sort of thing. Okay, we know that, that zero, again, is that asymptote, so we're going to include that here. And then we've got back here, we've got negative e to the 3 halves, positive e to the 3 halves, and that's just me taking advantage of one of the rules of, of uh, exponents here. That square root is the same as a, as a rational exponent, 1 over 2. If I choose a number less than negative e to the, the 3 halves, and I plug that into my, my second derivative here, uh, the denominator is going to be is going to be negative. Okay, the denominator is totally going to be negative. The numerator here, okay, and if I pick a, a really really a, a number that's really really large in the negative direction, this will be larger than six, so this will be positive. But the denominator will be negative, and so this over here is going to be negative. In the interval between negative the e to the three halves and and zero, okay, let's say like like one negative one. Again, the denominator goes negative, but if I plug negative one, and negative one's a convenient one because it makes this logarithm become zero. So I'm left with a negative divided by a negative, and I get a positive here. Okay, so it's going to be concave up in this particular interval. And now there is some symmetry in this problem. Okay, so if you pick a number between zero and positive e to the three halves here, this will become positive uh, this is zero again, but because of that six there, this will become negative. And then by a symmetric argument over here, this is going to become positive to what we did before. So our function here is going to be concave up on the interval, negative e to the three halves to, u, uh, to zero here, but not including zero, union e to the positive three halves out to infinity. And it's going to be concave down from negative infinity up to negative e to the 3 over 2, union uh, 0 out to e to the 3 over 2, inclusive there. Good. Now, that helps us identify that, that these two right here, these two values here of, of x, those are going to correspond to inflection points because that's where the concavity is changing, okay? So now what was the next question here? We want to find the exact coordinates of the, any maxima and minima. Okay. So D is going to be the exact values of the maxima and minima. Well, we know that those were going to occur. What did we get here? We had intervals of increase. So decrease, increase. So we're going to have a min at x equals uh, negative e. And so x is negative e. And if you plug that in, if we plug that into our, our function here, uh, negative e squared, it's just going to be e squared, okay? So that is going to be, um, what is it? That's going to be just 2 up in the numerator, so it'll be 2 over, oh, it's 2 over, but the denominator will be negative. Wait, I've got to do this again here. If you plug e, uh, negative e there squared, it's going to become positive e squared, okay? Because that's, that's what the square would do. But the natural log of e squared is just going to be 2, but the denominator was still going to be negative. So down here, this will be, end up being negative 2 over e. 
uh, we are going to get a max at x is equal to positive e and actually that turns out to be exactly the same thing just just positive uh, the next thing that we wanted was our inflection points okay and so all we were going to do here was to come up with the the y coordinates of our inflection points here so we've got uh, negative e to the three halves and let's just do this down here if you if you plug that in this will be the net natural log of negative e to the three halves squared over negative e to the three halves let's just take a look at what this done does here because I think maybe I should have explained that before the square here will make that positive and is going to cancel with the the two in the denominator up here in the exponent and you're left with the natural log of e cubed which is just going to be three so this will end up being negative three over e to the three halves so there we go negative three over e to the three halves and you'll get again a, a parallel sort of a, a situation happening on the other side where we've got e to the positive three halves and this will end up being three over e to the positive three halves okay now just to put this together uh, really quickly in a little sketch here and this is just gonna be a rough rough sketch here uh, we knew that we had an asymptote here okay uh, if you look at your intervals of increasing and decreasing we had what was it we had negative e here uh, 0 and e and we knew that it was decreasing increasing increasing decreasing if you look at your intervals of concavity we had this e to the negative 3 halves that's, that's over here uh, e to the negative 3 or negative e to the 3 halves I should say and then positive so 0 and here's positive e to the 3 halves and we discovered that this was going to be concave down, concave up, concave down, concave up. Okay, it looks like we had an asymptote here at the along the y-axis. We had a a minimum point here, and then if you do a little bit of the work, the, the comparatively speaking, the um, inflection point was a little closer to the x-axis, and then he had a similar sort of thing here. And then the inflection point is a little closer to the x-axis. So putting this all together, decreasing concave down to an asymptote had to look like this. Through an inflection point, changes to concave up, hit a minimum, and then we go up to the asymptote. And then here this is going up, concave down. So we're coming up from the asymptote. We hit our maximum, still concave down, decreasing, hit our point of inflection, concave up, decreasing to an asymptote. And that's what that function is supposed to look like.